So I, I, actually, I was just thinking, last week I was, okay, maybe let somebody come in, we've got noises and stuff. Somebody come in? No. So last week I was mentioning to you that um, uh, it's interesting to actually have people who study this stuff for real as opposed to the three of us who are just hobbyists. And so um, in keeping with that, in, in some sense, uh, really going to the heart of the matter, um, Roger Knoll is a emeritus professor of economics at Stanford who has studied stadium financing long, long before we started looking at our own. Um, and uh, he's also a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. So I think uh, with those uh, credentials, I'm very happy to have Roger come and talk. And again, in keeping with our little theme, he's going to talk somewhat about the Berkeley situation and put it in the national context. So thank you, Roger. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's interesting to be here. And uh, I actually am a frequent visitor to Berkeley because for a sin that is too private to recount, I served on the faculty budget advisory committees of both Stanford and Berkeley simultaneously 20 years ago in the financial crisis of the early 1990s. And uh, so I'm intimately knowledgeable of your finances as well as Stanford's. Uh, and that, that interest that occurred at that time has, has remained. And, uh, I was, uh, I've been on a whole series of UC committees since then. So it's not true that there is no connection between Stanford and Berkeley. You're looking at one of them, and indeed many of my colleagues are up here a lot as well. Uh, what I want to start off with is the, is the circumstance of intercollegiate athletics in the United States that we currently are in. Uh, because I think it's much misunderstood. Um, like almost all complex problems, um, there is a great tendency for simplification. And I can assure you, if you want to learn about the economics of sports, the last thing you should do is read the sports pages of the local newspapers. Because the journalists who cover sports uh, are, have basic, basically provide negative information. They, they don't understand it, they don't get it, and they tend, to, they tend also not consciously but uh, for deep unconscious reasons, tend to be shills for leaders in the, in the field of, athle of athletics. And the reason for it is, if you want to succeed as a sports journalist, the way you succeed is by having access to the team, and access to the coaches, and access to the owners. And if, if you, you can write honestly about the team, like if, if, if a team is having a bad year, or a quarterback has a bad game, or a running back fumbles four times, you can write <coughs> critically about the player, but you cannot write critically about the athletic administration, or you'll be denied access. And so as a result, the people who tend to be sports reporters are people who have a natural tendency to get along with management in the sports industry. There's a, there's a natural selection process that uh, weaves out. Like one of, my, one of my favorite sports journalists a few years ago was Chuck Nebius of the Chronicle. And he lasted on the sports page four years. And eventually he got moved over to now he's a columnist uh, 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 who writes in the, on, in the local news section. And the reason for it was he was just too honest uh, about writing about the business side of sports as opposed to the athletic side. So most of what you have read in the newspapers uh, is, is false. Uh, it's, it's overly generalized and it's overly optimistic about uh, how the finances of sports actually work. So to get back on track, let's figure out what's going on. And one of the reasons that generalizations don't work is because the circumstances of universities are so different. When you were deciding to come to Cal, you had lots of very different choices about where you were going to be a freshman. You could have gone, you had public versus private, you had large university versus small university versus liberal arts college, you had difference in emphases and specializations and teaching styles, and uh, it was a complicated decision. And there's no reason to believe that that diversity that you see in the academic environment for incoming freshmen is any greater than that diver than diversity in the athletic environment 
in which they operate and the circumstances of the university. And let's just get, let me just give you a couple of illustrations. Um, category one university, which would be a relatively small number of um, places like Stanford and Berkeley, uh, which are enrollment constrained and have extremely good students. So they have very little to gain by increasing the applicant pool, by making themselves more popular among high school seniors. Um, that it's, it's not likely that, the, that anything Berkeley or Stanford is going to do, whether it's academic or athletic, is vastly going to increase demand to attend that university for the students that they actually want. All right. That is to say, their enrollment, getting people to apply and getting the best students to come, isn't a problem for a handful of the best universities in the country. Two or three public universities and maybe uh, 10 or so private universities. Category number two is the con enrollment constrained university that uh, is unsatisfied with its quality and wants to improve the quality. Uh, my favorite example uh, is the University of Connecticut. Uh, why did the University of Connecticut move to Division 1A, uh, or the Football Bowls Division, uh, approximately a dozen years ago? The reason was the University of Connecticut had an inferiority complex. It believed that it could increase applications to Connecticut, and whereas it was enrollment constrained, its admission standards were relatively low, much lower than Berkeley. And it figured that if it did increase substantially applications, then it could satisfy its quota for admissions with, on average, better students. And so the motive for the University of Connecticut in going to Division 1A was primarily it wanted to increase the quality of the student body. And, uh, uh, and indeed, after it did go Division 1A, started playing in the Big East in football, it did have roughly 15% 15, 15 increase in the number of students who were applying. And it did have something, not a big increase, but it did have an increase in the average GPAs and SAT scores of the incoming freshmen. So whether that's a success or not, of course, it depends on was it worth it. And I'm not about to evaluate that. Only University of Connecticut and the Connecticut legislature can ev evaluate that. But that was their motive. And then there's a third category of university, which is not enrollment constrained. And here I use the example of Troy State. Why in the world would Troy State become a Division I-A football school? Uh, it has a very low enrollment. It has very low academic standards. Basically, everyone who applies is admitted, and they still can't fill the place. And from Troy State's point of view, uh, they were simply looking at the capitation fee that the state of Alabama, Alabama pays to its state universities based purely on enrollment. The more students you get, the, more, the bigger your budget. And they were sort of hanging by their fingernails. And they, what they did is took a financial gamble that by incurring the expense of big time college football, they would increase enrollment. And indeed, they did. Enrollment went up about 20% at Troy State when they joined Division 1A. Now, that may or may not uh, be worth it again, because on the one hand there was more revenue, on the other hand there was more costs because there were more students to spend money on, plus there was a, now a, a, a very expensive football program. So once again, I don't have enough information to be able to tell you whether this gamble was worth it, but that was the motivation. If you, if you actually find this in the public records of Troy State, this was the actual reason they went to Division 1A football. Now, so the, the very first point to bear in mind is that for some schools, but not all, the motivation for playing big time college football, or indeed being in Division I at all, playing big time college basketball, is in part a belief that it's going to increase enrollment pressure. Now it turns out if you actually do a statistical analysis across all universities and try to explain applications or changes in applications, on the basis of either which division are you playing in, if you, did you change divisions, what happened, or the quality of your teams in basketball and football, which are the only ones that really matter. 
uh, you find a very weak relationship, uh, a positive coefficient that isn't very big. And if you work really hard and you make the data confess, you may be able to get it to be statistically significant. But you actually have to try really hard uh, to get it to be statistically significant. And the reason for that, of course, is not that it's never true. It's just that the diversity of colleges and universities is such that you would not expect this to be a strong explanatory variable across all colleges and universities, just because when we think about Cal and Stanford, there's no way that the quality of our football team or the quality of our basketball team is going to increase either the quantity or the quality of undergraduates we have. So that is definitely going to suppress the Troy State effect that would be going on in the Middle Tennessee and, and Louisiana Monroe and all the other places that are sort of at the bottom of the academic pecking order that indeed had this motivation for playing big time sports. So that's, that's part number one, is that one of the reasons we have big time intercollegiate sports in the United States is that not among you guys and not among my students, but among a significant fraction of the population, the quality of the athletic program matters in their application and enrollment decision. And that's sort of reason number one. Right? Um, but then there, reason number two that has been advanced by advocates of big time athletic programs is the, uh, is the notion that, and this is true, this has been advanced on this campus, that the rationale for having a big time athletics program is that it's a, it's a, a way in to donors that you can get especially wealthy alumni to be interested in the university as a whole uh, if you use as the entering wedge a successful athletic program. And once again, this has been extensively studied. And uh, the results are sort of exactly as you would normally expect. Uh, number one, it is true that total gifts to a university are in, do go up both when you move from Division II to Division I and with the quality of the football and basketball programs. But that's something of a cheat. And the, the something of a cheat part is that the donations count the amount of money you pay to get the entitlement to buy a season ticket. All right, so for example, if you want to have a season ticket to Stanford football games, and you want to sit between the uh, two the two thirty yard lines. You want to sit on the shady side and beneath the pet press box, so you don't have to sit in the sun. Between the thirty yard lines, you have to donate fifteen hundred dollars a year in order to get the right to buy a season ticket. To buy two tickets, actually. Okay. Now, I see that as an economist as just part of the price of the ticket. But uh, Stanford counts it because that's the way accounting is done as a donation to the university. And they have to count it that way, because if they didn't, the donor couldn't take the tax write-off uh, for the 1500 bucks. If they just said the price of a season ticket is an extra $750, two tickets for $1,500, uh, then it wouldn't be deductible. And so they create the illusion of contribution um, in order to make it easier for people to pay the money, because they get one-third of it paid for by the federal government and the state government in tax deductions. So that's something of a cheat. We don't know really how to adjust for that because the data don't allow us to separate out the contributions that are related to the purchase of season tickets from other season from other contributions. But I'm willing to bet that even if we did that, we would find that get good athletic teams generate more donations. But they didn't generate more donations for the Department of Athletics. The crucial question that arises on campuses, and it's arisen on the Stanford campus as well as the uh, Cal campus, is do they cause an increase in donations to other academic programs? And the answer to that is a definitive no. That no one has ever, no. again, we economists are really good at making the data confess. Right? I remember Laura once wrote a paper about how good we are at making the data confess. <laughs> Only she didn't interpret that way. She interpreted it as well, how what a bunch of dishonest lobs we are. But nonetheless, <laughs> even, even though we're really good at making the data confess, in this case, we haven't yet found a way 
to make the data produce the result that universities want to see, which is that it's useful for their academic programs to have an, uh, uh, um, an athletic program. Now, there's a, there is a footnote to this, and the footnote would be the University of Connecticut footnote, which is the long-term significance. That is to say, if you do succeed in increasing the quality of your undergraduate enrollment by having a Division I athletic program, as the University of Connecticut believes is the case. To my knowledge, that's the only university that's gone Division I in the last 20 years that can actually seriously make that claim, all right, um, is the University of Connecticut. If that's true, then most likely those students, when they graduate, are going to be wealthier, on average, than they would, than would have been the case had the students been less good. And then they may give more to the university in general. So we don't know whether that's true or not. And, and I can't say it's not true. I don't have enough information. But that is the only remaining loose end on this question, is whether if you're in the category of universities that uses athletics to improve the quality of your undergraduates, then if you look down the road 20 years, do you find that you're getting more money than otherwise would have been the case? We don't know whether that's true or not, but that's the only thing that could be left. Then we have issue number three, which is how much does it cost us to do this? All right. And uh, the, this is the fascinating thing about intercollegiate sports is that it is a classic example of what uh, two economists, uh, uh, Bob Frank and Phil Cook, call a winner-take-all uh, event. That is to say, the very top teams who are persistently in the, ranked in the top ten, who persistently go to BCS bowl games, who persistently go into the NCAA tournament and last several rounds, play several games, those universities have a ton of income from athletics. And indeed, they, uh, you know, they have a lot more income than, than Cal does. All right? Everybody else, once you get out of this group of, of the most successful <coughs> schools, and indeed, the only school in the Pac-10 that is in that category, or Pac-12 now, uh, is USC. Uh, nobody else is in this category in the Pac-12. Um, so that once you get outside of that category, then these programs are costly. And uh, how costly? It depends on how big their aspirations are and how much uh, they really try to compete at the highest level. Now, what does it cost to compete at the highest level? Well, it does take a stadium, and it takes an athletic facility as well as training facilities because the four- and five-star athletes will only go to a school that they believe will adequately prepare them to be a pro. And the fraction of entering freshmen who are going to play football or men's basketball who believe they're going to be a pro is substantially larger than the number who will be a pro. Um, that is to say, a survey on taken of all, there are 300 over th there are 350 schools who play Division I men's basketball, and a survey was done of the students who play. Now, remember, each team has 15 players, 13 scholarships, and two walk-ons. So they did a survey of those 15 players times 350 schools. 30% believed they were going to play in the NBA. 30%. Now, if you quickly do the math, you find out that everybody who was a starter on every single team thought he was going to play in the NBA. All right? Well, that, of course, is silly and foolish, but that is the mindset that the typical 16 or 17 year old has when they're making the decision about where they're going to go to college. They think they're going to be a professional, the stars, the best players, the ones who are going to start. They think they're going to be a professional and hence they select their school on the basis of how they believe that school will do in training them to be a professional. And this requires elaborate facilities and a good coach. So that's part one of the story. Part two of the story, of course, is that the cost of having a good athletic program then is reflected in three things. There's the cost of the athletes, the cost of the coaching staff, and the cost of the facilities. The cost of the students is not something 
that universities compete over because it's dictated by NCAA rules. Uh, tuition, room, and board. One of the interesting features of NCAA caps on athletic scholarships is that the cap on an athletic scholarship is about $5,000 lower than most universities have as the cap on their financial need-based scholarships. In other words, lots of things that count in calculating financial need and therefore financial aid for uh, undergraduates um, in general doesn't count uh, for an athlete. Uh, as time has progressed, the NCAA has gotten stingier and stingier and stingier, and the gap until two years ago was growing. And then uh, an antitrust suit was a really good uh, combination Pell Grant plus athletic scholarship today, so bear that in mind. From the university standpoint, they don't compete on the basis of the price of the athletes. So then the question is, what happens to that difference? Uh, just take my, my great example. Uh, the, the, the last, I had, I, had as a, I had as a student John Pay. He, he wrote his senior thesis also about the degree to which he was exploited. He estimated how much he would have been paid had Stanford had to bid for his services as opposed to just give him a scholarship. And between fifty and seventy thousand dollars a year. And so if you think about it, yeah, you know, the, the, the star players of a college team probably be paid at least two or three times that now because there's so much, much more money in college sports. And so the difference between the 85 athletic scholarships and the amount that would be paid if these had, if, the, if universities had to behave like the pros and pay people real salaries to, for, for this activity is a huge number. It's in the millions of dollars. All right, so the question then is, where does that go? Now, the conventional explanation is that, well, it's a way to control the costs and to be sure that students, athletes are students, right? Which is, the latter is nonsense because at most universities they're not students. So uh, it, it's the controlling the cost to allow more, more schools to have teams is the principal argument. But the reality is, go back to my story again. How do universities compete for athletes? They don't compete on the basis of the salary, but they do compete on the basis of the facilities and the coach. So what happens is that these prospective profitability of employing an Andrew Luck at building more elaborate facilities as a way to get these highly profitable four or five star athletes to enroll in their school. Observe more and more and more money being spent on facilities and the salaries of coaches going through the ceiling. Today, uh, you really can't have a team that's persistently going to be a top 20 team in either basketball, all right? You just can't get there because the very best coaches, the ones who can attract the very best players and produce teams that are persistently in the top 20 and a good chance to go deep in the NCAA basketball tournament or a good chance to go to a BCS game or another high quality bowl game, those guys are coveted by 50 or 60 schools that, like Cal, have the illusion they're going to be a top school in athletics. And the competition among this 50 or 60 schools for the 20 or so coaches that actually can do that, deliver that for you, is intense and drives up the salary. So what, what, what the coaching market is, is an unregulated market where the profitability of suppressing the pay to athletes is transferred to the coaches, not the university. And, it, and it's also transfer, transferred into building more elaborate facilities. Uh, stadiums. So I, I, that's, that's a, a simple thing you charge $60 a ticket. No problem, figure that out. And Cal's roughly in the same way. So you, know, you might be off by 10%, you're not gonna get it wildly off. The things that really are, and, and moreover, there's not a whole lot of difference among universities in that. Um, you know, there, there are some differences because the prices are not all the same, but college football games are similarly priced with more than twice as much as Cal and Stanford. They, Michigan probably takes as much in in ticket sales as Cal plus Stanford together combined. So try, think about that. You're now Cal. You want to bid for a top coach 
You want to build a top facility, and right off the top, the University of Michigan has got more than twice as much ticket sale revenue as you do. That's hard, all right? But what I wanted to focus on now is what is the most important source of revenue growth. And what I've done here is I've done some strategic pairing of universities. Uh, the very first two are Cal versus San Jose State. All right, Cal versus Stanford would be uninteresting because since they both play in the, play in the Pac-12 and they both have stadiums of roughly the same size, their revenues are very close to the same. Uh, but San Jose State is the classic weak Division 1A participant. Um, note that, now let me go explain briefly what these are. Broadcast plus conference is essentially how much money do you get from selling your radio rights, your television rights, and the NCAA basketball tournament, and the, uh, the bowl system. All right? Those are all wound together. And the reason they're wound together is that um, a large fraction of that revenue goes to the conference and then is shared more or less equally, depending on the conference, among everyone in the conference. Conferences have two different, one and 11, and didn't win a Pac-10 then game. We got as much revenue from the Rose Bowl, cost of participating in the Rose Bowl, and so I, you know, I, I once did look at Stanford when we played in the Rose Bowl in, in 2000. Uh, we actually lost money being in the Rose Bowl because it cost us more to, to go down to the game and participate in it than the extra share we got of the revenue. All right, so that's really egalitarianism. There is no strong financial incentive from conference-based revenue for a school to be the Pac-12 champion because of the equality, equality. By contrast, you might wonder why the Big 12 is falling apart. And the reason is they're sort of in a strange netherworld. Um, they keep about half of the television and broadcasting rights for themselves but the schools are allowed to sell the other half, all right? The uh, University of Texas, for example, has something called the Longhorn Network, and it puts several football games a year on the Longhorn Network and keeps all the money itself from the sponsorships and everything that arrives from that. So um, from the, point, the reason Nebraska bolts for the Big Ten is because Nebraska is in a state that doesn't have any people in it, it has no media market, almost no opportunity for television revenue. If it goes to the Big Ten, it gets to be egalitarian. It gets to get just as much as the University of Michigan in this pooled revenue. And, better yet, the Big Ten has all of the television rights sold through the, through the conference. None of them are sold by the individual schools. So that's a really great deal for, for Nebraska. What's the compensating benefit for the Big Ten? Well, now they have 12 teams. <coughs> if you have 12 teams, you get to have a conference championship football game. So there's a big, huge source of additional revenue. And even if Nebraska never plays in that game, there's this additional revenue that will be spread among all the Big Ten members from having this game and the television rights and the attendance for it. So that's why Nebraska wants to go to the Big Ten, egalitarianism. Why does Texas want to go to the SEC? Because the SEC is the least egalitarian. The SEC will let them keep the most of their broadcast revenues and share the least of it with the rest of the members of the conference. Okay, so back to our Berkeley versus San Jose State comparison. You'll note that Berkeley has almost 10 times as much revenue from these licensing and sponsors uh, plus broadcast and conference. If you look over here, uh, 17.8 million dollars versus 1.7. Moreover, Berkeley's is growing and San Jose State's isn't. This is a gen generic phenomenon. The gap between the winners and the losers <coughs> in the sports not only is growing, but it's growing extremely rapidly. The, the top schools are experiencing revenue growth in the 8 to 10 percent a year category. The San Jose states of the world are basically flat. So the ability of San Jose State to compete for coaches, to build elaborate stadium and athletic facilities, is diminishing. People have always 
several people have asked me, well, why? It used to be the case that you know Stanford plays San Jose State every year. Um, it was a close game, and you know about one time in three or four, San Jose State would win. But in the last few years, Stanford wipes them out, even when we have a bad team. Well, there's the reason. They can't afford to compete. So they're sort of hanging on by their fingernails, whereas the Pac-12 teams are opening up the distance between them. But it's not all that great for Cal if I don't compare them with San Jose State. So what we have is these other pairings. Notice the revenue grow Alabama, Michigan, and Texas, the reason they're on this picture, is because they are the leading schools in the country in the revenues from these sources. All right, The broadcast, BCS games, NCAA championships, licensing. Licensing basically means selling jerseys and selling coffee cups with the university name on it. Uh, and sponsorships is people who donate to you to be a sponsor for your athletic events. It's not the same thing as paying to get a season ticket. It's, this is separate from actually buying a season ticket. This is being a sponsor of the team. And again, we're talking huge amounts of money. Michigan is the leader. It has the most revenue of any school in the country. And uh, it, not only is it number one in revenue at the gate, it's also number one in broadcast, conference, licensing, and sponsorships. Moreover, as you can see, it's growing extremely rapidly. And in particular, it has a huge growth in this sponsorship category. It's almost doubled in the four years covered by this table. There's Cal's problem. Cal wants to be in the same league as Alabama, Michigan, and Texas with respect to sports. There is a gap growing in revenue between Cal and these schools that's growing at the rate of two to three million dollars a year. All right? And so if you are a devout Cal fan, um, Montgomery or Tedford are as coaches, you're going to be increasingly distant to do the things necessary to a $250 million on the stadium and other athletic facilities. Because this is a, an attempt to get into this league. And it's an attempt to gain visibility, an attempt to get lots of sponsorships. It's an attempt to try to catch up, to go from this, this uh, uh, under $20 million total to the totals in the range of 25 to 35 million that uh, the comp competition is. And if I had USC on this list, I don't have the data for USC. I only have the data for public universities because the Freedom of Information Act can't be used against private universities. Mm -hmm. So the only private universities that I have are Stanford and Duke. And that's simply because they don't seriously try to play in this league. <laughs> So that they don't have, it's not embarrassing to them to reveal their finances because it's not like this. <laughs> but uh, so I don't have USC and I don't have Notre Dame, but they would be in the same league as these. They're not quite as good as Michigan, but they would be in the same league as these other schools. Okay, now let's get to the specifics about what in the world, how would it work? How would it work if you went, if, if you actually tried to make this play? to use the stadium. I think Cal believes, correctly, I believe, that they already have world-class coaches, coaches that rank in this top 20 or 25 uh, in both basketball and football, that uh, if they also succeed on the facilities front, they could compete for these top athletes. But the, the important fact is, if they do that, if they spend the money on the coaches and the facilities, and the revenue doesn't go up, they'll lose a ton of money. If we go to the actual budgets of the athletics departments at these top schools, Michigan's athletic department actually is profitable. All right? It actually generates more revenue than it costs. Um, that's not true in Alabama and Texas. They basically break even. So translate that to Cal. If Cal's run at the big time doesn't work, and they have the same cost structure as schools who generate 
to $30 million from these sources, and they stay at 20, they're in deep trouble. They're, the, the revenues will be insufficient to cover those costs, and the deficit will go up, not only go up, but go up substantially. So then the issue is, well, gee, is this, does this have any chance of working? And uh, um, let me tell you how it would work. All right. The how it would work part is, historically, Cal has absolutely sucked at fundraising. If you look at, for as a university of its stature, it does real, very poorly in raising money from wealthy individuals and alumni. And I think that the hope in the department, you can ask the Department of Athletics people and the finance people this question when they come to you, but my expectation is that the hope is that from the athletics department's point of view, that they can use this investment in new facilities as a way to generate more that would fall into this sponsorship category, which is the singularly most rapidly growing part of revenue for the most successful athletic teams. Now, whether they can or not, I don't know. Uh, certainly, there is the potential to generate more money for athletics. Uh, and whether they succeed is simply unknown. But that is the crucial element here. If that doesn't succeed, then the investment in the facilities, as well as the investment in a world-class coaching staff, will end up being unprofitable. I think I want to quit with a couple of minutes to go, because I want you to be able to ask me questions. And since we got a bit of a late start, I'll, I'll, I'll leave off a couple of other things and go to some questions. Anybody got some questions? Yeah. Um, the thing that you just mentioned about how Cal is really bad at getting alumni to donate. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess, yeah, this, this facility in the stadium is one way that I guess they hope that yeah. more alumni will donate. But what other methods have worked? Or is this what all the other schools do? Well, this is what the other schools do, is that, that uh, they're, you know, um, what other large state universities do is put forth they're, they're more, they put forth more effort and they're more successful in getting former students to give money to the Department of Athletics. All right? That's different than giving it to the rest of the university. Mm -hmm. Cal also has the other problem. Although that isn't as bad as it used to be. In the last decade, Cal has done a much better job than it ever did historically in raising money for academics uh, from its alumni and other wealthy people. Um, but it, it has not done particularly well. The Department of Athletics has been pretty moribund when it came to fundraising. The current director of athletics is trying to change that, and, uh, uh, and I simply have no good way of knowing in advance whether uh, the nature of the Cal alums is similar to the nature of Texas and Michigan alums. I doubt it, especially Texas. This doesn't look like Texas to me. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it's possible. But that's, that has to be the calculation. The, the, the numbers don't work unless you assume there's going to be a substantial increase in donations. And indeed, that is revealed in the pricing of the, of the seat licenses, the, the endowment gifts uh, for selling season tickets. They're, the prices that they have set for those are substantially higher than Michigan and Texas set for their latest stadium renovations. And so it, it, behind that must be this calculation that Cal alums are willing to pay a lot more than they have historically, and that you can use the mechanism of a stadium as a means to get them to, do, to, to start donating. And that it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a risk. But on the other hand, if you didn't take that risk, and if you're, if you're uh, an avid athlete, athletics fan, and it's unacceptable to you not to be a top 25 football and basketball team most years, then this risk is the only chance you've got. Yeah. And kind of along those lines as well, it, it seems like the risk is, it's an extremely risky investment. It seems <laughs> like uh, there's a small chance that the athletic department will, will actually turn out to be profitable after this investment in the facility. 
since it already has pretty good coaches. I, I think that's right, and, 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 the, and part of the reason for it is that the, the costs in general are going to continue to rise as long as the revenue of any schools rises. Exactly. You know, football coaches got a million dollars a year 10 years ago, they get five million dollars a year now, 10 years from now they may get 20 million dollars a year. Right. All right, if the revenue keeps growing, the premium you'll pay for a top coach will continue to grow. So one of the one of the big problems here is that they, I don't think very many universities have fully realized the uh, coaching side, uh, how how the the um, the growth in revenue is in substantial measure eaten up by the salaries of the coaching staff. It, it's not just the head coach, by the way. Uh, assistant coaches. When, uh, it's really interesting, when I first went to Stanford 25 years ago, I've been involved in athletics at Stanford a lot because I was an athlete and I, I, you know, and I, I admire the Stanford athletes because they're good students and they're serious and, and yet they play, have a 25 hour a week job. So I've been involved in it and when, when I first came, the assistant <coughs> coaches were barely living, right? They were being paid very low salaries. But today, the assistant coaches are paid several times more than a professor. All right, the, uh, the hundreds of thousands to a million dollars for an assistant coach. And it's for the same reason, that, that if you're a really good offensive lineman, you know who the best offensive lineman coaches are in the country, and that's the one that you want to play for. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. So it does seem that the, the I think we need to leave. I understand it's 2 o'clock. Uh, go ahead. We could have a couple more questions. Is it the same thing? Is another yeah. class of yeah. Class yeah. Class. yeah. So. What? What happens? Student. Actually, let's, let's get Justine in and then we'll have to count, okay? Um, for what you said about conferences, what's going to happen to schools like Notre Dame and Navy who are independents? Well, what do you think? The, the Notre Dame is a special case because it, ha it, it has its own national television network and it generates uh, more money from television than any other school in the country. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's in the range of 40 to 50 million dollars a year and it would be if you look down here this category of broadcast plus conference the broadcast is a fraction of that and you can see even the even Alabama which has the biggest total of that is 22 million so Notre Dame is getting more than twice as much money as, as anybody else in the country for its television but that's because it's Notre Dame um, Notre Dame is the leading Catholic University in the country top athletes who graduate from Catholic high schools their natural inclination is to go to Notre Dame. You have to work harder than to consider anywhere else. And they have a, na a nationwide following. When, when Stanford has terrible years, when we have teams that win one or two games a year, we will still fill the stadium when we play Notre Dame. All right? And that's because no matter where they play, they fill up the stadium. And so they, they're in a special category. And I, I'd be very surprised if Notre Dame makes a decision to go into a conference. It will be very costly to them, unless the conference made them an exception to the revenue sharing rules. Navy, uh, Army, uh, a bunch of other schools, it's definitely in their interest to be in a conference because the, they aren't that good, frankly. And, uh, and being able to be part of one of these conference television packages is a The last question, I think. Okay, let's assume that Cal's bet on the stadium doesn't work out. How does the stadium then get, how do all these additional costs get covered? Um, that depends on the legal details of how the stadium financing was set up, which I don't know. Uh, it depends on the nature of the debt that is uh, undertaken. It strikes me as extremely unlikely that that is completely that that debt is solely secured on the basis of athletic revenues. So would, I would be shocked if it's not a debt on the university as a whole. Because I don't think anybody would lend money to the university if it were not an obligation to the university as a whole. But that's a question to ask the financial vice president when he comes, vice chancellor. I mean, I, I don't know how they structure it. The, the big problem with the stadium, this is, the sta this is whether it's pro or college, Unless you're Stanford, thank God, because we only spent $95 million on our stadium. I don't know how you guys managed to spend $350. It's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's called dishonesty. But we didn't start to build ours unless we had raised, until we had raised all the money, and it took oh, us cool. several years to do it. So we, we don't have any debt overhang. Uh, but I, I, to me, you know, it would, I, I don't understand why they 
didn't wait until they had a lot more money before they started construction. Because they only stopped coming. <laughs> To be clear, the $321 million you're talking about is just the renovation of the stadium per se. Yeah. There's another $150 million or so for the Steve Network High Performance Center, whose ribbon was cut last week. And, <coughs> and it doesn't cover the eastern half of the stadium. Yeah, it's only yeah. part of the renovation. Yes. Yes, I know. I, as I said, I don't know how you guys it's managed fine. to spend that much money. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, all I can tell you, I'll tell you a story, uh, an apocryphal story. The guy who ran the stadium construction at Stanford is John Arriaga, who's a real estate developer here in the Bay Area and an alum, starting point guard on the basketball team, and now a billionaire. And uh, John was in charge of running the bidding for <laughs> building the stadium. And the story is, when the bids came in to tear down the old stadium, uh, John called up a guy and he said, I have good news and bad news. The good news is you won the bid. The bad news is you're being paid half as much and you're doing it twice as fast. The response immediately was, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you again, Roger.